This is Toby Capwell, historian, author, and expert on medieval and renaissance arms and armor. Today he's joining us to share his thoughts on the Arisen's varied arsenal and armor in Dragon's Dogma 2. Now is it advisable, when sitting on the back of a dragon in flight, to start stabbing it? I have been sitting on a horse a couple of times when it's been stung by a horsefly. You're in for a wild ride after that. If you enjoy this kind of content, be sure to check out our previous episodes and subscribe for more experts breaking down your favorite games coming very soon. But without further ado, it's over to Toby. We can immediately see with this game so far that we're dealing with a lot of the typical design uh, obsessions of of the present day. Generally, the martial arts form in this game, the way the characters move with their weapons and fight is, is not great. They're moving very inefficiently and they don't look really like they know what they're doing. The fighting isn't so much fantastical as just bad body mechanics. Even if you're fighting monsters, if you're in a human body, you still need to move efficiently and use your weapon correctly. And that's not really going on here. It's great that he's got a shield, but when he moves, He's immediately moving the shield away from his body, moving it out of the action, when the shield should always be right in there. If you move your shield out of the action, you might as well not have it. I understand that, you know, in a game visually, there has to be a kind of visual expression of the power and the physical impact and, you know, sort of exaggerating the movements. But from the point of view of a martial artist, it just sort of looks like he, again, doesn't know really what he's doing. So it's kind of generic and improbable and impractical on a number of levels, but there are some things to like here as well. He's wearing a helmet and he's got a shield. And those are two things straight off the bat that are super practical and basic and things that are good to see that you don't, that you don't often get. Overall, the, the kind of rendering of the steel surfaces and especially the mail is done really well. The mail looks good, that the sort of material level of this is nice. The convincing appearance of the terrain and the material textures is at odds with the way it's put together on the body. The environments and the materials make sense, but the composition doesn't. There's a lot of asymmetry. Everything about this just about is asymmetrical. Asymmetrical versus symmetrical design is a key principle that you always have to be thinking about when you're looking at armor. But there has to be motivations behind making the armor symmetrical or asymmetrical. Here they've chosen to make it asymmetrical, as far as I can tell, purely because of their vague impression of what looks good. Why does he have one big shoulder plate? On the side where he also has a shield. Why is he building up all, you know, plate armor on secondary areas? like his forearm and his shoulder, when he's got nothing on his body. The helmet's good, I'm glad he's got a helmet. But if you've got a helmet and you then think to yourself, now I think I'm gonna add some more plate armor, put it on the chest. Even in a fantasy world, I would like to see more rationale behind what the characters are doing. You can see where the designers feel like they're on firm ground, where their experience is informing what they're doing. Their rocks look great. Their water looks great. Their lizard skin looks great. But when it comes to putting the armor together, it's clear these are not armor users designing this game. Lord say our best will do. Yes, of course, I see it now. I grant you lightning's fangs. Here, you see a character who's got more plate armor, and that's nice to see, because you know big pauldrons, the big shoulder plates, the articulations, I never want to see those by themselves on a guy who's otherwise naked or just wearing mail like our previous character. He's got a bever here, this, this chin plate, um, but it's hanging low on his chest and not actually protecting his, his chin at all. Actually, a lot of historical reenactors wear their bevers incorrectly like that because it's sort of more comfortable. But look, you can see his chin, you can see his throat. That plate is obviously not doing what it's supposed to be doing. You know, the designers here might have seen photographs of reenactors or they might have seen something from a, you know, a television drama where normally people are not wearing the armor correctly. It's a mistake that gets copied and made into another mistake and another mistake and another. These mistakes have a habit of kind of perpetuating themselves. I don't know what's going on with his upper body. He's got a decent placard 
But up here, there's some kind of riveted plate undercoat thing that doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, again, priorities. If you've got the money and the capability to have full arm defenses, leg defenses, decent helmet, plates on your abdomen, you're gonna have a, a plate protecting your heart and your lungs, probably, as well. So this kind of deletion of crucial elements for the sake of a, some kind of abstract visual effect, it, it's not totally working. The blade, it, it evokes the sense of a Renaissance falchion. Falchion, or a storta in Italian, is, is like a, this short cleaver-like sword. We could do without the spikes on the hilt, though. But otherwise, that's a nice looking falchion. And we see plenty of examples of men in armor fighting with falchions like that. This knight, although he's got a fair amount of armor, another nice feature is that he's not wearing armor on his lower legs or feet. If you have to make concessions, getting rid of secondary plates like the lower legs and the feet often makes sense and you, you often see that in reality. That was incredible. Plate armor is the precise opposite of a life preserver. It doesn't take very much weight to sink a human body catastrophically. And an armor that weighs 25 or 30 kilos, you're going down like a stone. Not even, not even the best warrior in the world can deal with that. So, throwing your opponents in the water seems like a good tactic, maybe, if you're, if you're physically capable of doing that. With the design, it's also important to step back a little bit. And overall, I think this knight this knight character looks looks pretty good. I appreciate also seeing, you know, someone with a substantial amount of armor still moving easily, still having a certain amount of speed. At least he's not being shown to be clunky and clumsy and cumbersome. I cannot assist you at present. It's surprising how much physical abuse you can actually put up with when you're in complete armor like that. I mean, I haven't been thrown around by an ogre, but I have come off of horses at high speed before. You have this sense of physical forces greater than you acting irresistibly on your body. And you just have to kind of wait for it to be over and trust the equipment to do its job. It can feel a bit like being in a washing machine or a tumble dryer. And you know, you just wait for it to end. And that seems to be what he's doing. That's his strategy with, with, the, ogre, <laughs> with the ogre as well. Well done. Here's a guy with an interesting looking scale armor. It's a very old form of plate armor and really ingenious in cultures that are only technologically capable of making small pieces of metal. So if you need to cover big areas of the human body with small pieces of metal, scale armor is a good option. This design though is enormously weight inefficient. They've got to have a long skirt on everything. And generally that's not a great idea because you've got a lot of weight and a lot of metal hanging down there, not doing anything. The skirt thing is an aesthetic that's grown up mostly, I think, from television and film where they're making the armor out of polyurethane. And there are certain things you can make out of polyurethane like helmets and breastplates, fine. But you can't make articulating joints. You can't make things that have a finer fit efficiently on a big scale production. So almost invariably from like Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, they don't want to do leg armor. So they just say, let's make a big armored skirt and hope nobody notices. These big armored skirts are, they're not a real thing in reality because they're very inefficient. Better to just find a way to put some decent protection on your legs and don't protect empty space. I've never thought too much about the ins and outs of fighting crocodile people. Generally, big reptiles like this have a softer underside and a harder backside, but that's usually because they're floating around in the water. If it was a lizard man walking, that it had evolved to walk upright, they may not be like that. I don't know, I'm no expert on lizard people. I just like the ones in this game. I think the crocodile people in this game look good. But one thing you could consider doing, I mean, in St. George, and generally dragon fighters, I guess it's a, it's a related field, they often try to stab them in the throat. Don't stab the armor, 
go where the armor isn't. So on a crocodile person, try and stab him in the mouth, try and stab him in the eyes maybe. A martial artist should try and make his job as easy for himself as possible. You were right saying the dragons in this game have an exposed, sort of weak side. Oh, they do? Side. Yeah. yeah. Sort of that's, a, onto it. that's a perfectly respectable looking dragon. Lots of nice work in this game. I'm a big fan, though, of the, of the environments, the geology, the flora, the plant life. They've done a nice job with all of that, which is why, again, it feels inconsistent. Some parts of this are done really well. Other parts could, could use some work. This character, I think, is especially illustrative of some essential problems this game has with its design, which is stylistic dissonance, where the different elements tell different stories and they don't really agree with each other. He's got a helmet that looks kind of very early medieval. It, it evokes the kind of crusading period. Then he's got the sort of Landsknecht puffed and slashed leggings or hosen, which you know is very, very strongly evocative of the early 16th century in Europe. I don't mind if they're moving between periods and whatever, but the designs should still be harmonious. That might be my fault. Oh, really? Because I dressed this guy. Oh, you did? So you just, you just... That's not their fault? No. That's your fault? Yeah. <laughs> You're just, okay. you're just pooping my style choices now. I would have thought you'd learned something by now. One thing that is worth mentioning though, again, going back to the helmet, is the flat topped early to mid 13th century kind of profile of this helmet. People say, oh, it's a terrible design because the top is flat. There's no glancing surface. So if someone hits you on the top of the head, it's just gonna conduct through. There's you know, lots of nonsense like this in the literature. And actually, when you're dealing with a culture that's fighting primarily with edged weapons, bladed weapons that are used as cutting weapons and almost concussively rather than stabbing, you're never getting hit on the top of the head. You're always getting hit at an angle straight into your brow and having a really sharply angular helmet like that, which has a, a really strongly reinforced edge with a couple of layers of metal overlapping on that corner, that's a really strong way of protecting your head against those kinds of attacks. Not a great choice in a game where there really are creatures who are eight or 10 feet tall and will hit you on the top of the head though. So the rules change when the uh, opponent's species diversifies. <laughs> There's more I actually like about this one. The look of his armor is more consistent. All of the parts seem to be of the same style. They all seem to work well on the body. The, the elbows are sticking out. There's those annoying sticky out flanges that shouldn't be there, but let's just ignore that for the minute. His armor is symmetrical. He's got nice besigues on his shoulders, but then the besigues are repeated on the on the elbows, so there's a nice kind of design harmony. The helmet actually has several historical references on it. You know, fantasy armor is nothing new. Here, they're making some clear references to Renaissance fantasy armor. The wings on the side of the helmet, that's a real late 15th, 16th century thing. You see winged helmets all the way through, you know, art of the German Renaissance. And if you look really closely on his skull, he's got lines of eyeballs chased into the skull of the helmet. In Renaissance art, that's this thing you see again and again on dragon's wings. And there's real Renaissance armor made in the 1530s and 40s that has eyes embossed and chased on it just like that. Again, somebody's got at least one book on real armor on their, their studio library uh, shelf, which is nice to see. Would you say this helmet is modeled after a salad? salad? It is, it's a salad. You can see it's got the tail sticking out the back, the articulated tail. The tail is too high though. If your opponent can reach around and grab that tail, he has control of your head. When an opponent has control of your head, you will usually then lose the fight. So salads do have tails like that, but they're usually trying to keep them you know, at very particular angles so that they don't make the opponent's job too easy. In interestingly, in game, it's called a fiendish armette. So they've confused two real world historical helmets here, right. I think. 
Yeah, I mean, fiend, the word fiend refers to a demon or a devil more than a dragon. So I wouldn't use that word. And I wouldn't call it an armet. An armet is a helmet that has a rounded skull with hinged cheek pieces that come down so that the helmet can embrace the, the face quite closely. There's nothing, nothing of an armet about this at all. That may just be a, a, you know, a language problem. He also has armor made out of dragon skin on this too, it seems like. And that's not without a historical precedent either. In the chivalric epic poem Orlando Furioso, written in the early 16th century, there's a, a knight in, in, in that story named Rodemont, whose armor is made out of the tan skin of a dragon. So again, perfectly nice Renaissance reference there. Now, is it advisable when sitting on the back of a dragon in flight to start stabbing it? I have been sitting on a horse a couple of times when it's been stung by a horse fly. You're in for a wild ride after that. I, I can't imagine what a dragon would do if you're sitting on it and you stab it. You'd be lucky to stay on it and lucky to survive, I would have thought. This is the lamellar armor. Oh, this is, this is called lamellar armor? Yeah. All right, that's not lamellar armor. Sorry. The plates look too flexible. They look like they're made out of rubber or something anyway. Real lamellar armor would have been cool though because real lamellar armor was often worn by human cultures that used archers, mounted archers especially. Mongols, Scythians, all kinds of Central European peoples wore lamellar and shot bows. So it would have been a good idea. Real lamellar armor, it is rectangular plates like that, but they are not riveted to a backing as you see here. That's a different, different thing. With lamellar armor, very specifically, the individual plates have holes on the sides and they're laced to the next plate. It's a technology of lacing small plates to each other rather than attaching them to something else. So, you know, the spirit of what they had in mind was fine, it's just the execution is wrong. That was a skillful bit of theory. Another thing I, I wish we didn't have so much of in this game, is when they've got plate armor, on the elbows especially, like look at these elbows, the upper and lower edges are sticking way out Real armor tends not to do that. If it has to have a, a rising edge like that, it's gonna stay kind of close to the body. When you're fighting someone at close quarters, as they approach you, if they know what they're doing, they're gonna be looking at your equipment and they're gonna be taking stock of the handholds that you have provided to them. Different armor can be grabbed in different ways to sometimes catastrophic effect for the wearer. You don't want armor that's going to stick out like that if you can avoid it because it's going to be bad in a grappling situation apart from anything else. And once it's sticking out away from the body, again, there's more metal on you than has to be there. It's becoming too heavy. It's becoming too weight inefficient. The griffin as a mythical beast figures a lot on armor decoration in the 16th century, particularly on armors made for high-ranking members of the ruling Habsburg dynasty. And one of the three Habsburg beasts, the kind of visual icons of the family, was the griffin. So you see a lot of griffins on Habsburg armor decoration. They're heading for a kind of vaguely Renaissance aesthetic here. And notice how some of his plates have embossed feathers on them. There is real surviving armor that looks just like that, the embossed and chased feathers on the plates. If you go to the Real Armoria in Madrid, the, the, the Royal Palace Collection in Madrid, you'll see armor that looks like that. I wonder if they saw that in a book. If someone's cracked a book here and it has actually looked at some real things, that contributes to a, a certain kind of Renaissance impression on this figure, which is kind of nice. There's a lot of cape wearing in this game, isn't there? Oh yeah. A lot of these armored guys have just got to have Batman capes. There's not a lot of cape wearing with real armor. The problem with a cape like that is you can step on it, fall over, someone can grab it. Sir John Chandos, very famous English knight in the 14th century, was killed because he was fighting in the winter. It was cold, so he was wearing a long gown over his armor to try and keep the heat from getting out. And he was attacking up a slight incline and he stepped on his own skirts and fell over 
And as he was getting up, one of the enemies stabbed him straight in the head and killed him. His capes didn't kill him outright, but he would not have died had he been wearing a shorter coat. a distinct sort of non-European feel to this character, which is probably what they're after. The central plate on the chest is a very sort of Asian style of armor. You see it a lot on Iranian armor. It's just interesting to me that when you look at a game like this, you can really see very specifically what the designer's experience is, what they know something about, and, and where they're on shakier ground. It all comes out visually. It's funny that when you have a, a character who's more Asian in their qualities and inspiration, the Japanese game developer is on firmer ground with the movement style as well. So the movement style is gonna be something that they're probably more familiar with. There's a, a global interest now in the study of historical European martial arts. I think they're starting to become better known, but, but still, not nearly as, as ubiquitous as Asian martial art. The daggers stood out to me. In game, they're just called Bardish daggers. A Bardish dagger. And it looks like just the head of a Bardish. It's a been... Bardish without the staff part, yeah. Bardish dagger is kind of a, a slight nonsense, but it's nice that they're referencing the origin of their idea. I feel kind of bad for the wildlife in this game though, you know? I mean, that's a beautiful, amazing creature that they've rendered fabulously well with the, the feathers and everything. And then there's these annoying humans who've come to chop it into small pieces for no obvious reason. This guy is obviously supposed to be some kind of magic user. So he's supposed to look far out in one way or another. If you're gonna wear big steel shoulder plates like that, the big giant spikes sticking in all directions are obviously kind of a bad idea. How far are you willing to go into the realm of impracticality for the sake of your visual appearance? This is an important question in the history of armor design. The historical record shows us that warriors were willing to make functional sacrifices for the sake of looking amazing. It's not that they didn't do it, but your flights of fancy are still governed by a practical world. How's he gonna walk through a door? How's he gonna avoid not putting the waitress's eye out when he goes to the tavern? I'm being a pedant. I am, but that's sort of my job. But I, I think there is something to say for the visual appearance of characters helping to contribute to the the verisimilitude and the believability of the world that you're trying to create. And if you start putting any old nonsense on your figures, that suspension of disbelief kind of is in danger of falling down when those same physical laws don't apply to what the characters are wearing. I don't deny the importance of looking cool. That would just be wrong to, to deny that looking cool is important, but it's about balance. How far can the coolness go before it's gonna seriously impede your ability to do your job as a warrior? I feel like this guy's get up is a little outside my experience to comment on. He's got a sword that is also trying to double as a war hammer. In fantasy things, you often see swords that have notches or hooks cut into the end like that. I think it's pretty well known that there were warriors in, in like the early medieval period, in Scandinavia, for example, who did wear wolf skins or bear skins like this in an effort to be more psychologically impactful, to suggest that they had shape-changing powers or at least that they were summoning the power of those, those predatory species. One of the really useful things about armor people often forget about is that, yes, armor protects you against a direct and immediate threat, but one of the real advantages it has is protecting you against other secondary or incidental dangers, which you can't necessarily allow for when you are actively defending yourself. You're fighting one person, you should be able to stop him hitting you in the head. But what about the arrow who, that comes sailing in from this direction that you had no hope in seeing? Or the rock that someone threw at someone else that ends up hitting you? 
And I worry when I see people running around in leather pants because they may be great martial artists, but what about all that other stuff flying in? Seems risky. Thank you so much for watching. Remember to comment below what other games you'd like to see on the show and be sure to subscribe for more content like this and beyond.